we're gonna get a lot of new charts popping up thanks to Pulse Chain. It's gonna be a lot of fun. And uh, with the buy and burn, let those bots arbitrage in between those uh, dexes. I mean, it's gonna be good for us. Actually, that definitely does make sense because you know how Alex makes the Hedron front end always able to access the Uniswap, you know, protocol each time that a new chain launches. So that probably, that almost certainly is it. So, so I was under the impression one pulse would last you a while. Like you'd be able to do many transactions with one pulse. That was the case. Is, is, it, because, is, it, is it because um, of the Jack Levin thing? I know, I know he kind of ruined it for everyone. It's not because no, of Jack. Doing... Like, yeah, even in the beginning, like as soon as Mainnet went live, I think uh, it was still like 80 pulls or something or 50 pulls for a swap. So like the one pulse never helped. I don't know why it is actually like that. But yeah, so just to have a little bit of clarity on the one pulse thing, uh, imagine that all people that hold Bitcoin transacted or wanted to transact within the first hour, uh, all the people that, cons that, that transact on Pulse Chain, part of it, yes, uh, there was uh, some addi additional congestion. Effectively, about ten hours after the the it was known that the chain was accessible. Uh, once that tweet went out about it being live and stuff, and then people went to to uh, basically engage. But you know, there are transactions. I see them. I did them too. That were uh, 0.08 of a PLS, uh, 0.07 of a PLS, 0.06 of a PLS. So uh, the comment earlier about, you know, I thought that the one airdropped PLS in every Ethereum's wallet would be enough. Well, it was. It, it was enough uh, until basically, not because of Jack, I don't want to say it as far as Jack, but as far as like the rush of people trying to say, how can I get ahead of the line to engage with uh, this platform or this blockchain? How can I... Uh, you know, start to ratio trade and, and, and maybe I was in PLSX and I want to go to PLS or maybe PLSS, PLS people say, hey, if that ratio is wild and wonky, then I want, you know, a seven to one ratio or 10 to one ratio of PLX. So like the the narrative that gets out there and it's it is the dramatic narrative is, man, it didn't work for me because only one and now it costs 80, right? Well, keep in mind, 80 is eight cents. Eight cents at mass transaction, mass hype, mass, you know, two years of waiting participants that are already uh, in the choir and in the church of, uh, of uh, uh, this RH ecosystem. Now there's the bridges and the bridges are basically people that want to come in uh, that are new economic energy. They're new participants. There are people that are bridging from Pulse Chain to Ethereum so they can do the same thing and they're going to pay you know, you know, 10, 20, 30, $50, whatever it is at the time in ETH gas to set up uh, liquidity and be market makers there of, of, of tokens that are coming from Pulse Chain over to Ethereum. And there's and the same thing is happening that you can see on chain in the bridges of, you know, a dollar value of like the mid 20s or $30 million worth of uh, value. So when it launched, I have a lot of transactions that I'm looking at in my own history that were under a single PLS. And then I see that there were spikes up in PLS transaction cost that were, you know, 80, 100, 1000, you know, kind of PL, uh, PLS burns. And again, 1000 PLS is 10 cents, I think. Uh, you know, so like, keep that in mind as far as the perspective. Um, this is a good experience. This is what happens when markets go live. Uh, this is what happens when, you know, uh, Apple was not a massive company, but you would have people waiting in line uh, at the Apple store for the new release of a cell phone or the new release of, uh, you know, uh, Star Wars, uh, you know, uh, the Jedi strikes or whatever. Like hype is a, is a thing. Participants, uh, you know, uh, behind the red rope waiting to get into the club is a thing. Like that's part of this. I'm willing to uh, slip a hundred bucks to the doorman to get into the club kind of uh, uh, narrative that get, that is is what happens in code in Ethereum and it happens in code in Pulse Chain. People just want to participate. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's actually a good a good point if you put it like that i mean 80 pools to do a transaction is only eight eight cents as you say um i did see some that were like i don't know a few thousand pools but if that's the case it's still only like 30 cents or something which is pretty cheap um and i guess that as the value of calls goes up it is going to get reduced because there'll be less activity going on the more people care about the gas fees so it does make sense i guess um 
So yeah, nice, nice point. Um, agree with you. Um, I know that there were some FUD points that were, you know, again, FUD or, you know, basically the, the principles, cryptocurrency, DeFi as a narrative. Instead of a central exchange, you can be the liquidity provider. You can provide the service through making your liquidity available instead of the exchange. You can be the market maker. You can be the one that bootstraps. You can be the one that finances and trades. So like part of the, you know, Richard uh, or OA had this uh, massive amount of treasure chest that could have been deployed and put as liquidity to make this all seamless and, and uh, you know, uh, user experience, uh, you know, quicker, uh, maybe, maybe in some people's view, painless. Well, that isn't DeFi. Um, and uh, the pseudo anonymity qualities of blockchain transactions is you don't know who's on the bridge now. You don't know who that $25 million bridging across from Ethereum belongs to. You know, it could be every participant, it could be single or, you know, entity and daughter addresses and obfuscated or whatever, but you don't know. And it kind of goes back to the same thing we've heard for many years. Uh, where'd the ETH go? Uh, you know, where did the lemons go when uh, people were streaming on different uh, different uh, platforms? Like the, the nature of DeFi is, is pseudo anonymity, barn raising. Everybody, you know, chooses to volunteer and uh, lift up the, the building, you know, in a barn raise or they can kind of fake it and they can say, well, I'm not really going to put any energy in. I'm just going to stand here and look like it by holding my hands up. Like that is the nature of this um this thing. So I think Richard's done amazing. I think that he's walking the landmines that are constantly be re being relocated in regulation and, uh, you know, government uh, uh, rule. And I think that uh, the platform is doing exactly as it was designed to do with rollout as appropriate to keep uh, to keep things sticky and engaging uh, over the next, you know, 18 months, 18 to 24 months is is basically the way I see the the ramping up and ratcheting of value on all of these things on the decks or on the chain. This is an experiment. This is DeFi. This is either going to work out long term and create adoption, which is community related, or it's not. And I'm betting that it is. I've been enjoying everything that's going on so far. You know, the FOMO element is I see people getting upset that they spent a thousand PLS. And that's the same people that if they did participate in sacrifice, that's 10 cents. Uh, if they uh, if they there's narrative around it's too expensive and people can't do math like Eric Wald did math saying it was like one hundred dollar transactions. Show me the one hundred dollar transaction, my friend. Uh, that's not true. So like uh, some of this stuff is just like informing uh, politically savvy conversation, whatever kind of marketing. And, uh, you know, if nothing else to say it's available, check back in three months. Yep. One thing that I'm afraid of is uh, people having a bad first experience, making them not want to learn more about the thing. Sure. So if they have a great, yeah, they have like a great first experience yeah. on Ethereum, and they have a great, great experience minting an NFT, uh, engaging with OpenSea, uh, you know, security uh, as a model. Like if they have a great, amazing experience and the only difference is price, then you can just say, hey, there's some bumps in the road of this rolling out and the trade-off of your uh, experience, user interface, engagement, whatever you want to uh, stall or time delay, whatever you want to call it in this congestion of a launch um, is price. Th that's, that's the difference. You want to do something on Ethereum, $10, $5, $20. I haven't looked. Uh, whatever it is as far as the price during a bear. Uh, uh, here is a differential in price. Here's your participation in price. And when they say, man, it sends me, it costs me a hundred bucks to put it into the bridge. Okay, that is Ethereum because one side has a transaction cost that you're thinking of in dollars in Ethereum gas. And the other side has a receiving transaction that you're thinking of in gas that has a price point of pennies. So like, just keep it in perspective when, you know, informing people. Don't say mistruths, don't say half truths, don't, don't uh, make it more than it really is, uh, you know, to make it more grand and, and feed the FOMO. That's not necessary. We've got an amazing community, we've got amazing products, we've got amazing code. And, you know, honestly, uh, evolution in all of these things, I see Jack's in the space. Jack was in the space the other day and uh, with Eric having conversation. And both of them, I thought, were saying something about uh, like forced evolution in cryptocurrency. If you think that that's good, this is a, this is a forced uh, evolution of cryptocurrency. Um, BRC20s, ordinals, uh, Zen, all these things are, are basically catalysts 
simply catalysts for people to figure it out. What do you like in your society? What do you not like in your society? How do you want things to transact? How, how do you want to, to market or frame, you know, uh, the benefit or trade uh, opportunities in crypto? Like these are just thought provoking and engaging with new audiences opportunities. Yeah, well said, well said. Literally farming and stuff. Every time somebody does a transaction, buying or selling, there's a bot that looks at the transaction, takes some of the money out and buys PulseX off of the open market and burns it. A little bit of that gets paid to people that execute the burn function, but every transaction a bot buys PulseX, pumping the price up and burns it, increasing scarcity. So it's a pretty sweet little system. But it might help to understand if you actually look at the burn function on PulseX. In the, the three dot menu, there's a burn button. If you click the burn button, it shows you PulseX buy and burn. And you can actually go and execute the burn function yourself and get paid for it. The idea is like, I mean, you could prepare the liquidity while it's out of whack four to one, and then it could close. So you could start with 5,000 Pulse and 20,000 PulseX and have it end up at 10 and 10 if they end up at parity. So there's all sorts of different ways to think about liquidity. So one of the best ones for me to do it is what assets do I like? Well, I mean, I like Richard Hart assets. I like Pulse, I like Pulse X, and I like Hex. So do I really care which coins I have? Maybe in some cases, because I run some model math models. But um, when it comes to Hex, E-Hex and P-Hex, well, I have a little bit of E-Hex coming on over the bridge, and I have a little bit of P-Hex. And when it comes to which one of those I have, I'm thinking, hmm, do I really care? Because Paul should make me wealthy enough to be able to afford Ethereum. So I should be able to run my X there. So why don't I just pair it on Pulse where it can help uh, add to Hart's Law parity stability and I can earn fees doing it. I'm just going to wait for the pools to stabilize a little bit. That might be one of my plays. Um, so if there's other tokens in the system you like and you're like, well, you know what? Even if they end up out of whack long term, I think they're both going to do well. I don't care which one I end up more with more of. Like, basically, for me, I'm constantly thinking how I'm not going to get myself wrecked. So I'm trying to think of the most practical ways where, you know, no matter how this works out, I should be relatively okay, which is why I've been thinking about stable coins and pairing Hex, like anything that should have some amount of uh, parity. Like, Hex, uh, Hex is the way said very excellently. Ethereum and Pulse might actually learn to match each other. And I'm thinking during this bull run, like up till the super cycle of 2025, is going to be crazy. But as we see a crash and then we go into matching cycles, we'll probably see a lot more similarity in ROI. I mean, they'll still skew. But no matter what, when you're playing this game, what you're hoping for is the fees that you're earning are going to be uh, more than the impermanent loss. So whether that includes the incentive token in an incentivized pair or just the pool. So any pool that's getting a heavy, heavy amount of volume and is very, very small is an excellent chance to buy up a bunch of tokens, add to that pool and catch the, the, the fees. A lot of whales get in and just see a new token, buy up a bunch of it, pair the liquidity, wait for it, don't care that it's pumping up, and break the fees and then exit liquidity and dump. And that's usually pretty hurtful to the project. There are more benevolent ways to provide liquidity if you like a system, such as actually maintaining, hmm, maybe I don't want to provide liquidity if I think it's about a pump because one, I don't want to take in permanent loss, and two, the more liquidity I provide, the harder it makes for that price pump. So maybe if I want to be a beneficial whale, I want to have low liquidity when I think we're in the bull cycle and put in that liquidity when we're hitting the bear market. Because if I add liquidity at the top of the market in, say, a stable coin I don't care about and a bunch of token that I really like, well, people are about to drop the price of it 75%, which is a 4x down technically. So that means I'm about to double the number of tokens I'm providing at the top while halving my stable coins. So I'm technically DCAing into my favorite pair while providing more liquidity to stabilize the price. So I've given a lot of thought to liquidity providing, obviously. Yeah. So, okay. So in, in my scenario, you know, I probably uh, got in uh, to adding liquidity when uh, Pulse X to Pulse, it was, it was like, I don't know, somewhere three and a half to one. And um, so in, in this case, you know, I've lost some uh, Pulse X and gained some pulse, I probably hurt myself in terms of losing out on some of that appreciation on the pulse X compared to the fees. But 
something interesting um, that you, based on what you're saying, is so on a stable coin. Um, basically, if it's always, you know, the ratio is always going to be the same between, um, you know, a, a stable coin. Uh, well, in the sense that the stable coin is always one. So in, 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 in you know, one to one with like a, a dollar. So if I did like USDC pulse, uh, theoretically, I shouldn't lose any pulse in that situ- situation. Is that is that correct in thinking that way not quite we still get the same if one side doubles the other side halves but that's why i talk about pairing it at the top of the bull market if you paired it now people would be buying it so they'd be putting in the usdc doubling the usdc and halving the pulse to get a 4x pump up but if you waited till say theoretically not financial advice the top of 2025 and you're getting a signal like richard called the top of bitcoin then maybe you don't want to see pulse price crash that much and you realize at that point, people are going to be throwing pulse into the pair to get at the USDC. So providing liquidity at the ratio at the top of that market would work it the other way if you believed pulse was going to pump back up in another cycle afterwards. So it comes down to what you believe the asset is going to do to gauge your personal risk about how you might want to engage with the project. Man, this tappity-tap-tap dance of not giving financial advice is difficult. I'm going to get sued.